Amen. And on a more exciting note, uh, thank you everybody for coming this morning. We are incredibly happy that you have come to day two of LACE. We have action-packed day. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to dive in and get started. My name is Julie Murphy. I am your program quality director here in Founders District. But more importantly, our speaker today is Daniel Mitson Short. And the best way to thank him would be to give your honest feedback at the end of the session today. Our tech master will drop it into chat toward the end of the session, but don't worry if you miss it, I will send you an email afterwards with all our sessions today and the recordings. If you're not speaking, please keep yourself on mute to avoid background noise. You may keep your camera on though. Daniel has a fun and interactive session planned for you today. If you wanna see him instead of his presentation, you can drag the speaker window to the left to make Daniel bigger. With that, Daniel is a speaker, writer, and founder of Shorthand Content Marketing. He's spoken to audiences around the world as a keynote speaker and workshop trainer. We're very happy that he is one of Founders District's own. He's a four-time semifinalist for the World Championship of Public Speaking 2019 finalist in the World Championship of Public Speaking and has delivered two TEDx talks. His passion in life is sharing ideas and tools to help people grow their confidence and success to move toward their goals. I'm confident that after listening to Daniel today, you are going to be better equipped to build a better you and a stronger club. So take it away, Daniel. Thank you, Julie. Appreciate the intro. Thank you so much, everyone, for showing up early on a Saturday morning. I think to begin with, we should all just have a quick sip of our coffee because we can do that in the virtual format. So please do that for me while I share my screen in the background. And we will get started momentarily. Actually, I'll have a sip of my coffee as well. Happy New Year to everybody. It's lovely to be here with you all. I haven't seen many of you in person for quite a while, so it's lovely to see all your friendly faces there and to have a bit of laughter before we start. Today, I have some ideas that I'm going to share that I have been thinking about over the past, I would say, six months that have helped me to change the way I've been approaching life and speaking in different things, especially during these interesting times that we're all living through. There's that old Chinese proverb that says, may you live in interesting times. I think we've all achieved that, <laughs> that's for sure. So buckle in, I'm gonna share some ideas with you today and hopefully they will be of value for you. Now, to begin with, I wanna ask you a quick question. Does anyone remember 2019? way back when things were idyllic, when you could travel anywhere you wanted to on a plane, you could walk into the grocery store and stand really close to someone, you could go to a party and say, hey, do you want a taste of my drink? And they say, sure, no worries. It was a really idyllic time. It was a crazy time. This is kind of the most representative image I could find of 2019. We're all having a great time. We're all talking too close to each other, breathing the same air. And there was this, just this feeling of camaraderie in the air. In fact, I remember everyone saying back in 2019, wow, imagine how good 2020 is going to be. It's going to be the roaring 20s over again. And we're all kind of excited for this new decade. I was as well. I had just made it to the world championships. So I got to speak in front of 2,000 people on a live stage. I was traveling around the world. My business was growing. All these wonderful things were happening. And I was very excited at the end of 2019 for what was coming in 2020. And of course, we all know what happened. Surprise, surprise, the world completely changed. And next thing you know, we're all dressed like ninjas and we're all walking around mistrusting each other, trying to steal each other's toilet paper and hoard all the food and hide in our houses. And life was very, very different. And if you said that this would be the fashion look of the 2020s, I don't think anyone would have believed you, but nowadays it's very commonplace. And if you actually see someone's face, it's almost a bit shocking. So I think that we've gone through a huge cultural shift in the past couple of years, and we're still kind of recovering from that in a lot of ways, signaled by the fact that we're all sitting in our homes today instead of in person. But I wanted to share that to begin with because I think a lot of things were lost or changed during those past couple of years that we don't really notice, or we don't really acknowledge a lot of the time. 
So what did we actually lose in 2020? Well, obviously we lost a lot of our conventional behavior. We weren't able to do the same things that we used to do as easily. There were a lot of restrictions and rules and things that we couldn't do, couldn't go places, couldn't act in certain ways anymore. We had to stand at a certain distance. We had to check in at certain places, depending where you were in the world. But it was a very weird time for all of us. We also lost the ability to make plans, which for someone like me is very stressful because I love to plan out my year ahead and what I want to do and where I want to go. And I couldn't do any of it because I didn't know what was happening. And I think underneath all that, we lost that sense of certainty, that sense that we know what's going to happen in the world. We know how things are going to be in the future. And that can be very, very stressful when that's taken away from you as we've all been through in the past couple of years. I think worse than that, we also lost a lot of interpersonal connections. So the fact that we couldn't just go somewhere and visit people face to face. For me personally, I couldn't travel to go and see my family in Australia. And that was a very unusual feeling. I didn't have that connection with them anymore. And I noticed as time went on during 2020, as I was locked down in my house a lot of the time, that my interpersonal skills started to fade as well. It was kind of not as normal to talk to people face to face or be around people. And I noticed I wasn't as good at interacting as I used to be. And then I also noticed this kind of mistrust in people who weren't my friends or my family. It was like everyone else except for the people I knew was suddenly a risky person to be around because they might have COVID or they might not be following the rules or who knows. So our trust in community started to fade as well. We didn't have that feeling of connection like we used to. And that's something that's been happening, particularly over the last 20 years, I think, is that that connection and that interpersonal relationships that we used to have, they're fading a lot of the time. So I wanted to share these things, not to put a downer on what we're talking about, but just to show what we've lost, because very often we don't realize these things are happening almost surreptitiously in the background. They're starting to fade away and they're starting to cause a different feeling, a different sense of stress in our lives. Now, for Toastmasters, it was even worse because for Toastmasters, we lost the very thing that Toastmasters is supposed to represent. We lost that supportive and encouraging learning experience and we all became disempowered. And if you know the mission statement of Toastmasters, this is actually the complete reverse of it. This is what happened to us all. We started to forget about developing communication and leadership skills. We had less self-confidence and we had no personal growth because we're all kind of stuck in our houses and there wasn't a lot we could do. For people like us who love to be out and about learning and developing ourselves, it was a really tough time because the thing that we love to do the most, which was to grow and develop our speaking and leadership skills, was taken away, especially in the beginning when we didn't even have the virtual format. So I think we were hit in a, a unique way that we didn't realize was such an important part of our lives. Suddenly it wasn't there anymore. I know that for myself, how much I relished being part of my home club and also the larger community of Founders District, and suddenly that wasn't available. And so these things really have given us a shock, have started to change the way we feel and think in our lives. Now, back in 1971, there was a famous book that was written called Future Shock by Alvin Toffler. And Alvin Toffler is a futurist. I don't know if anyone knows this book or has heard of it. He's actually updated it several times since, and he's since passed away. But back in 1971, he coined this idea of things in the future actually overwhelming us, us not being able to cope. And he's kind of defined future shock as this psychological distress by someone who's unable to cope with the rapidity of social changes. And I think especially in the last couple of years, if Alvin Toffler was arrived, alive, he would have said, see, see what I was talking about? This is what I'm talking about. And it's amazing how much that has impacted our lives just in a couple of years of the rules changing and the systems changing. So I think it's very interesting to go back and look at the way we used to perceive the world. And if you look at something like in 1970, what he thought was changing compared to how things are changing now, it's astounding. But it's amazing that even back then, people like him were noticing that something was shifting in the world, leading to where we are today. And what it really leads to is this, this sense of confusion, anxiety, and sometimes even just a withdrawal into apathy. I know for myself, by about probably mid-2020, I'd reached this point where I was kind of like, eh, what's the point? I'll just wait this out. I'll just see what happens. I wasn't making any plans. I didn't have any goals. I didn't have anything I was really looking forward to. I was just kind of waiting around. And that might be something you relate to too. You kind of get into this malaise, this kind of inertia that isn't helping you in your life but you don't know what to do about it. You don't know how to change or to grow in this 
environment that we're kind of stuck in. So my question is, and I've been thinking a lot about this, was how can we reclaim our old lives? I think a lot of us have this nostalgic feeling, like I was talking about 2019 and the years before that, that was a golden time, right? When we could do whatever we wanted and live how we wanted. And maybe in you know 20 years, we'll all be saying, oh, things aren't the way they used to be when I was a kid, because we had a golden era back then and now things have changed. And I have noticed as we all age, there is a tendency to kind of look backwards, right? We spend our time saying, when I was a kid, this cost this amount, or you were able to do this or whatever it is. And we kind of reminisce about the past. And we ask ourselves, how can we reclaim our old lives? And I think particularly the last year or two, that's what we've been focused on a lot, is trying to get back to what we used to have, especially when it comes to speaking and things like that. How can we reclaim what we used to have? Well, I finally realized about probably, I don't know, six months ago that we can't, that it's actually impossible to go backwards and to live your life in reverse. And I want to give you a demonstration of this. You can join in if you like. Just try by facing forward, just try to look behind you if you can. See how far you get and don't injure yourself. But that feeling that you feel is kind of what it's like living your life in reverse, trying to say, how can I get back to that? Because you're supposed to go forward. You can't see behind you. You can't live in reverse. And I think that's important to acknowledge because when you're trying to live your life like that, it is like trying to see behind you. You're struggling and you're putting yourself in pain that you don't need to be because you're able to focus forward, which is what we're going to talk about. So I also like this analogy that when you try to live in the past or reclaim your old life, lives, it's kind of like this. And now I have an uncle who loves to dress in 1970s fashion. I know we all know someone who's probably like this and they're staying where they are. They, they stopped updating their wardrobe in 1970 and they're saying, you know what? The old fashion is going to come back. I'm just going to hang here. It'll come back. Don't worry. Don't worry. And we know over time, the things just change and they're happy in that position and they're going to live like that, but they're not going to advance. And over time, they become outdated and archaic and almost a little bit of a parody of themselves. And I do think that there's a risk of us doing that as well if we only focus on what we used to have. So I think this is a great metaphor if you know someone like this, or maybe you are someone like this, who tends to stick to what they used to know or how they used to be. There is that kind of consequence that the world moves on and you're just stuck in your old uh, style or fashion. So the old ways of living, working and relating are gone. And that's something that is sad in a way, and it's frustrating, and it's not something that we want to admit a lot of the time. But I think that the sooner that we accept that, and the sooner that we start to move forward, we will actually be able to enrich our lives. And I'm going to share some ways that I've been able to do that, that will hopefully help you. So here's some good news after all that. And this is something that I learned during the last year, particularly in 2021. During times of great change, there is opportunity for growth. And there are many ways that you can develop yourself and you can improve yourself and you can improve your lot in life simply by looking for those opportunities for growth rather than just lamenting what was. And so I think that if you really focus on the opportunities and what you can do personally, you will find that you're actually quite empowered. You'll find that you do have a lot of choice in your life and you're able to change things as much as you want to. Now, I just started reading this book actually yesterday. I'm part of a book club, which I'll talk about a bit later. And this is our book of the month, Don't Feed the Monkey Mind. And as I was reading it last night, I came across a quote, which I thought was quite significant for what we're going through in the world today. And this is a book about changing your patterns of anxiety and worry and fear in your life. And she said in the book that life always provides adversity for which we need flexibility and resist resilience. And I think that's very true. But then she also said, life also provides pleasant surprises, joyous moments that we can't anticipate. And I think that's really important to remember too, that yes, we need to be flexible and resilient, but we also need to be open to the new ways that we can connect, the new ways that we can evolve and grow ourselves. And that's what I have certainly learned over the last couple of years. And you might have noticed that in your life as well, in different ways, you've been able to expand or grow or find new joyous moments that you weren't expecting through the new channels. So with this in mind, 
I'm going to share a concept that I have been thinking a lot about the last year or two, which is macro skills. And I've never really seen anyone else talk about this directly, but it's something I think it's very important for us to be aware of macro skills in our lives, particularly with the way the world's evolving and changing. Now, all of us have a particular skill set in our life. You know, some of us might have a profession that we're in that we're very skilled in a certain way. Some of us, for instance, are very skilled with technology. Some of us might be good artists or musicians or good at sports or things like that. We all have natural talents and we have natural skills that we've developed over time. But I think above and beyond those skills that we have individually, there's these things in our lives that I call macro skills. They're actually skills that are very transferable and able to use at a broader way in your life. You can actually transfer them to different parts of your life and you can empower yourself and others if you develop these macro skills. So the idea of macro is kind of, it's over the top of everything. That's the word, that, that's what it means. So the idea of macro skills is that if you develop these things in your life, you will find that they actually help you significantly in all different facets of your life. Now, I want to share three that I have been focused on, but there's a lot more of these and you might have your own macro skills, but I would encourage you to work on these with me over the next couple of years as we evolve and grow together. So the first one, which is kind of like preaching to the choir with who I'm speaking with today, is speaking, professional speaking, public speaking, putting yourself in front of an audience in some format, whether it is like this or whether it is in person. Public speaking, I've noticed, gives you a power that very few people have. When I started speaking back in 20, I think it was 2010 for the company that I used to work with, pre-Toastmasters, I was amazed at the people who could get up and speak in front of a group of 50 or 100 people and influence them and get them to think differently and get them laughing and all those different things. I used to think this is a superpower. I'll never be able to develop this. And it was only out of necessity because my company forced me to start to speak in front of those same groups. And I was so scared that I went to Toastmasters and I remember forcing myself to go to Toastmasters, probably like you did the first time and thinking, this is going to be terrible and I'm going to die of fear, but you actually got through it. And lo and behold, today you have this skill, this macro skill of being able to speak. What I noticed was in my life, as I developed a bit of self-confidence and the ability in my skills as a speaker, it opened up a lot of new opportunities for me in particular at different events. So if I go to a wedding, for instance, I felt very confident doing a speech there. If I was with a group of people, let's say five or 10 people, I felt confident standing up and leading the group and speaking and sharing my ideas, whether it was socially or in business, different things like that. And this ability to speak was something that I really doubled down on, especially my first couple of years of Toastmasters. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to really hone this skill. And I went out and I looked for mentors. So I got to know some of the world champions of public speaking, other professional speakers outside of Toastmasters. And that time that I spent developing that macro skill of speaking had a huge reward for me. I found that I was not only getting paid to speak professionally, but I was getting, sometimes getting invited to travel different places and I was able to use it significantly in business. So much so that by the end of let's say 20, uh, 2015, I was starting to lead the events for my company. And they were saying, how did you get so good at this? And I say, well, I just went to Toastmasters and I worked on this skill. And so I would encourage you, even though you're probably a competent speaker now as part of Toastmasters, to keep developing this skill, keep trying different ways, whether it is online at the moment, or maybe it's speaking to a group of youth, or maybe it's speaking at a church, or it's trying to do a professional keynote, whatever it is, keep expanding those skills. And you'll find that that macro skill really opens up a lot of doors because it gives you that power that very few people have. So keep working on that macro skill. The next one, which is a bit contentious, and it depends how you feel about this. But I believe selling or influencing, persuading, if you want to call it that, is a macro skill as well. And this is something I personally resisted for a long time. Even though I work in marketing, I thought, well, I'm not a salesperson. I'm not that person who goes out and tries to get the deal. I'm not sleazy or pushy or anything like that. But I realized that the ability to persuade and influence people in an ethical way opens up a lot more doors for you. Because if you can figure out what it is that people need and what they want, and you can figure out ways to help them with your services or your products or your insights or whatever it is, you have this huge ability to open opportunities for yourself and for other people. 
So over the last couple of years in particular, as I've grown my own business and working with clients, I have really doubled down on this skill of selling and learning ways to do it professionally. And there's different approaches. Obviously, there's a more pushy old school approach to selling. And then there's a more modern consultative approach, which is much more ethical and patient and calm and guided. And I would encourage you to think about this in your life is how could you learn to persuade and influence people more and to develop that skill? There's a lot of great books out there. One in particular that I highly recommend is called Spin Selling, which is a book about a new model of focusing on sales. And for anyone who is interested in a better way to do it, you'll find that it aligns very much with speaking and presenting ideas as well. So I would encourage you to think about this as a macro skill as well. I've found as I've grown my business, as I've led different groups, being able to persuade and influence people in an ethical way, it makes a huge difference in your life. So selling is my second macro skill that I've been working on that I'd encourage you to focus on. And the last one is leading. And again, this is something that Toastmasters focus on a lot. It's part of our mission statement. But I think that the only way that you can really make a bigger impact in the world is through the support and the efforts of others who join you on your mission or your quest or whatever it is you're trying to achieve. I have a tendency, as I'm sure many people do here, to try and do everything myself. I'm a you know, self-motivated person and I feel like I'm fairly competent in my life. However, my weakness is that I won't ask for help and I won't let go of control. So I have had to learn, particularly during these times when we can't do everything ourselves, to ask for help, to enroll other people in the vision of what I want to do, whether it's in business or whether it's outside of that. And to learn to lead, set up a vision, encourage other people to take on tasks, get them involved and delegate and give them the power to make an impact as well. This is a very unique skill and it does really coincide with the others, the ability to speak, the ability to persuade and influence or to sell ideas and a vision to people really makes you a better leader. And there's a lot of great books out there. We have an incredible program in Toastmasters that will help you to be a better leader as well. But what I would encourage you most of all to think about is change your identity to think of yourself as a leader. That's something that for a long time, I really struggled with. I saw myself as doing things in my own life, but I didn't think that I had the ability or the, the permission, if you like, to lead other people. So I would really encourage you to think of yourself as a leader. And fortunately, as you all know, being part of Toastmasters, you're kind of sometimes thrust into a position of leadership, let's say, or strongly encouraged to become a leader in your club or your division or the district. And that actually is a bit of a godsend. It's a gift because it forces you to change your identity. I remember when I became the president of my club, I didn't think of myself as a leader. I thought of myself as a speaker. But I noticed every week when all these people would be looking to me for guidance, the whole club would be staring at me, I had to change my identity as a leader. And that really changed the way I related to a lot of people in my life, in my family life, my personal and social life, and also in business. So those three macro skills are three that I have been focused on. And I would ask you to think about, maybe write one down right now. You will know for yourself, which of those do you need to develop? Maybe even though you're into Toastmasters, maybe you need to refine or keep improving your speaking skills. Maybe you need to focus on influencing and persuading, or maybe you need to really change your identity and focus on leading. But I promise you, if you focus on those skills, particularly in this time when the world is a little bit more dormant, when we come out of this time, especially, you're going to be much better equipped to, to move ahead in your life. So I would encourage you to think about those macro skills and how you can develop them and keep developing them. Every week I'm focused on those myself and how I can keep improving. And I found that they really helped me. The next thing that I wanna share with you is the idea of some new tools. And for some of us, we're quite adaptive as people and others aren't really. So I want to go through and do a little bit of a history lesson here. Some of you might remember some of these tools that we used to use. I don't think anyone here Maybe, I don't think anyone would have ever used one of these, but maybe someone in the audience there knows what this is. Does anyone want to go off mute for a second and share what they think this is? What's it? Telegraph. Telegraph. 
<clears throat> telegraph. Yeah, telegraph. The telegraph machine. For Morse code. I think my grandfather did this before they had teletypes. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. <laughs> SOS. So this is a telegraph or telegram machine, I think, depending where you grew up in the world. <laughs> But essentially, it was almost like a Morse code machine, as far as I understand. I never actually used one. But it would send messages over very long distances. Tele means distance. So telegraph, telegram. And the other person on the other end would interpret that. Sometimes it would be in a little printout. If you remember the Adams family, the original one, Gomez Adams was always getting his, his telegraph things on the machine. This was the height of technology in the mid, I would say the mid 1800s up until probably the early 1900s. And then we went to this fancy device, which some of you probably remember. I remember one of these. My grandmother had this in her house. And I used to love dialing numbers on this thing, going all the way around. The amazing thing was you actually had to know the phone number as well. If you remember back then, you either remembered the phone number or you had a little book next to the, the telephone, which you'd look up the person's number. Usually the numbers were a lot shorter too. They'd be six digits or seven digits. And you would spend all this time ringing and it would go... And eventually you would get to hear the other person on the other end. The other incredible thing with this tool was that it would ring and you wouldn't know who was actually on the phone. You would just go, oh, it's ringing. Maybe I'll just answer it. I don't think any of us do that anymore. We're like, who's this? I'm not answering this call. Forget that. This was a time when we were much more trusting and open. And we thought it was great to just you know, randomly pick up the phone and talk to whoever was on the other line. It was a great device, but it really gave you that power. And I remember talking to relatives on the phone as a child. And actually, my dad, who I didn't live with, rang me on the phone and said, guess what? You've got a little sister. And I remember that time thinking, oh, OK, good. And that's how I discovered I had a little sister, because she'd just been born. And it was through the telephone. So I mean, these tools are quite incredible for their time. And they really changed the world. Does anyone remember this beauty? Does anyone remember what this is? That's a fax machine. Fax machine. That's right. <laughs> the old fax machine. Now, I was just thinking this and morning. I think I was using a fax machine up until around 2005. I used to work in my family business and we did construction and landscaping and we would fax plans to contractors and they would come through. Does anyone remember when you would pick up the phone and there'd be that fax sound? And you go, oh, and hang Beep. back. And <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so all these tools, the point of this is, besides the stroll down memory lane, is that these tools at one point were incredibly useful and valuable, but over time they got antiquated. They're not as useful anymore. And I remember the first time I got an electronic fax, which was through an email. And I thought, well, what do I do with this thing on the computer? Do I print it out? I mean, I don't know what to do with it now. And nowadays we don't even do that. We just have it in digital format. So you know how much we've evolved. Well, I want to introduce you to the tools that I think are we're evolving to next, which is apps and software. And these are four in particular. Some of them you probably recognize, some of them you don't. But I want to share in a little bit of time I've got left some of the tools and how I've used them and how I think I would encourage you to keep looking for ways to do them too. So the top one, top left, does anyone know what that is? YouTube. 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 Excellent. How about top right? Zoom. 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 Yes, I think we all know that one. We all know that dreaded little camera icon. <laughs> some of us love it. Some of us have got Zoom fatigue for sure. What about bottom left? Does anyone know that one? Mm -mm. No, that's a tough one. That's a, a service called Twitch, which I'm going to talk about. It's a live streaming service. And what about bottom right? Meetup. To meetup. Meetup. Yes. Excellent. So these are four tools that I have found have been interesting to look at. And some of them I use, some of them I'm just interested in, but they are great ways to connect and communicate with people, especially over a distance, that tele connection that we're all looking for or we're all using at the moment, and especially bridging back into real life as we are. So what I've noticed is that there's this tendency to put things on a hold in our lives. And I was guilty of this as well. I had all these things that I wanted to do in my life but I was putting them on hold because I was thinking, well, when things get back to normal, then I'll do this. But what we've kind of fallen into is this trap, this, like I was saying earlier, this inertia, this kind of resistance to, well, I won't do it yet because of COVID, because of Delta, because of Omicron, because of whatever's coming next, who knows, Decepticon, who knows what we'll have next. But this putting on hold is almost, it becomes an excuse. I've noticed that a lot in Toastmaster clubs too, where we say, well, I'll come back once it's in person, or oh, I'm only gonna join online once a month or something like that. 
we're putting things on hold more because it honestly it's easier but these tools i believe give us that ability to connect in new ways now an example that i had to adapt to over the last couple of years was instead of doing speeches a lot of the time in toastmasters these five to seven minute speeches i adapted to start doing videos on youtube so I started to put together every week or every couple of weeks, different ideas that I would have presented at a Toastmasters meeting in video format. Now, the first couple of my videos kind of sucked, to be honest, they weren't that great and they were boring, but I learned over time how to speak to the camera, how to be funnier, how to kind of use edits and different things like that. And slowly, lo and behold, I started to build a bit of connection online. What I realized about the value of YouTube is that, it's random in terms of who you will connect with. So when I go to speak at an event, for example, let's say there's 50 people in the room or hundred people, that's it. That's all the people that I can connect with. That's all the people that I can impact. But with YouTube, one of my videos right now has 150,000 views, which is a total amazing fluke in some respects. But if I got the chance to speak to a room of 150,000 people, not only would that be terrifying, but it would also have a much bigger impact. And that's what I think the value of a tool like YouTube is. You don't know how far your influence can go. So I would encourage you to think about if you have ideas and things that you want to share with the world through your speeches, try making them in video format. Make a different version of the speeches you've already done in Toastmasters in video format. Now, if you watch any of mine, you will notice that it's literally the same thing you're seeing here. It's me talking to a camera in my spare room in my house. Maybe there's some music sometimes. Maybe there's some slides here or there. But you'll notice that also there's comments of people saying, thank you for sharing that idea. I didn't think of it or that really helped me. And so the impact that you can have through a medium like YouTube is incredible because it goes well beyond what you can do. And right now, while we're talking, there's probably someone randomly around the world watching one of the videos that I've created. And I'm only a small YouTuber, but I love the idea that I can impact people in a new way with this new tool. So I'd encourage you to think about, can you use that one? The other ones that I had on the list there, uh, one in particular, Twitch, is a live streaming service. And originally it was just for video games, but these days you can do anything. You can stream just yourself having a chat about something. You can do book reviews. You can share music. You can do artwork. There's all these different things. And formats like Twitch are a great way to interact with audiences live, to build a community. And some people have had a huge impact by doing that. And that's something that I'm looking into as the years evolve too, is potentially doing more live streaming. So I'd encourage you to look at that one. The other thing that I talked about just in the tools there was Meetup. Now, in the middle of uh, last year, I got kind of tired of being stuck in my house and I really wanted to connect with more people. So one of the things that I did was to join a personal development book club in Irvine where I live. And at the first meeting, the organizer decided not to show up. She just didn't show for the meeting. And so there was all these people standing around. We met in the park, so it was COVID safe. And we're all just standing there. We didn't know what to do because the person who organized the meetup decided not to show. So me being someone who had some skill in speaking just decided to put my hand up and say, hey, should we start the meeting? And lo and behold, we started the meeting and we all talked about the book that we were reading that month. And the next month, the organizer came back and she said, hey, Daniel, I can't make the meetings anymore. Would you like to lead the group? And I thought, okay. So I asked actually a couple of other members because I realized I needed to work on my leadership to join in and actually co-host with me. And now we have a group that meets every month and any of you are most welcome to come along. We do one personal development book every month and we meet in the park. And now we've got a group last, I did a meet up last week, we had 35 people show up. And I just wanted to share this as a way to show you how your macro skills can develop in ways you weren't expecting. But there are opportunities even now, sitting in the park, talking to people, meeting people, you can do these incredible things. So I would encourage you to think as we start to wrap up here, what is it that you want to do? Because whatever you want to do in your life, there is a new way to make it happen. It might be through these new tools that I was talking about. It might be through things you're already doing. But think about whatever it is you want to do in your life. Think of how can I make it work? How can I adapt and evolve and use these tools to make the impact that I want to make? Because I think at the end of the day, that's really what we're missing the most from our old lives is that we were empowered to do things. And I believe that there is a new way to make it happen if you think about it and you keep trying to grow. So my last question for today is that what would be the best mindset for the future? 
what is the way to think? What, how should we perceive moving forward in our lives? Does anyone have a thought about this? Does anyone have a good mindset that they think would work for the future? A word that might symbolize it? I know this is a broad question, but I'm curious to know. Does anyone have a way that they Wonderful think adventure. Wonderful adventure. I love that. Flexible. Yeah. yeah. Flexible? Act now. Act now. Yes. Explore. Explore. Yeah, absolutely. Openness. Openness. Openness, did you say? Openness, yes. Yes, I love it. Absolutely. These are all correct. And I 100% I agree with that. I think the more we are open, the more flexible, and the more we see it as a wonderful adventure, the better we're going to adapt and evolve. One of the great metaphors I learned in life, I learned this from one of my mentors who I never got to meet. His name is Earl Nightingale. Some of you might know of his work. He was a personal development writer and speaker back in the 1950s through to the 70s and 80s. He had this metaphor of a ship on the ocean. And he said, very often a ship that's on the ocean will be getting pushed by the tide or the, the current back and forth. It will go off track. And for 99% of its journey, it can't see where it's going, but it knows the captain of the ship knows where he's going because he's focused forward, because he has a destination in mind. He has something that he wants to do with his life or where, where he wants to go with that ship. And because of that, he doesn't let the tide or the waves or the weather or the current push him off track. And even if he does, he gets back on track and he goes to his destination. And every time I see a ship in the water, that's what I think of is that the captain of the ship, they have a vision or a direction that they want to go and they're focused forward. They're not looking behind them, figuring out what, where they went. They're not worried about the waves that are crashing on the sides of the boat. They're just focused forward. And so I think that encapsulates everything that I've been trying to do, particularly in the last couple of months, because there is this tendency, as I said, to look back or to idealize what we used to have back in 2019 or whenever it was that we feel was the best time in our lives. But really when we do focus forward, there's an opportunity for growth, for development and also for impact. So we are all those ships in the water right now. Sometimes a wave comes up that we're not expecting, but I promise you, like me, if you keep focusing forward, you will find what it is that you're looking for. You'll reach your harbor or your destination or whatever it is. And I wanted to end with this quote from Gandhi. He said, the future depends on what we do in the present. And I think someone just said before, act now. So I would encourage you to think about what you wanna to do to focus forward, look at your skills, look at the tools that you can use and to realize that you can do it now. You can make an impact right now if you start to change and improve and that will significantly impact your life as time goes on. So my friends, I want to finish with that idea of focusing forward and encourage you to join me on this new adventure. We don't know where we'll be in a couple of years, but I know we'll be on it together. And I will say thank you. If you want to connect with me, that's my handle for all my social media, for Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, et cetera. And I'm here to support you all. So I'll pass back to our, our room monitor. Thank you. <laughs>